the construction of well over 300 kilometers of new roads, 200 kilometers of railway lines, 76 tunnels, two athletes' villages, 24,000 hotel rooms, and a grand total of six Olympic stadiums. The Sochi Games of 2014 were, without a doubt, the most expensive Olympic Games ever. The initial budget, $12 billion. The eventual cost, more than $50 billion. The actual game saw 98 events involving 15 different winter sports, but the construction was not just for the two-week-long event. The aim to create a real resort to attract tourists from Russia and abroad, to ensure a legacy was built for the future, that legacy sought by the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, who even spoke in French about his desire for Sochi to succeed. Soutenez, s'il vous plaît, le rêve olympique des millions de Russes qui attendent votre décision avec l'espoir. Je vous remercie. Four years on, though, as the world has now witnessed the Winter Olympics, this time in South Korea, how do we look back on Sochi? Well, of course, the scandal of Russian doping has led to some athletes being stripped of their medals. But has the actual resort of Sochi become that planned tourist and sporting attraction it was supposed to, to those forced from their homes for its construction, believe it to have been worth it? Well, to find out, Elena Volochin and Thomas Lowe revisit Sochi for France 24. On the shores of the Black Sea, a seaside resort prized by the Russians since Soviet times. But since the Olympic Games, Sochi has developed a very different image. Starting with its transport links. Along with the new train line, this road now connects the sea to the mountains. And at the end, are three new winter sports resorts. The largest is Rosa Couture. After the Olympic competitions, it's become a paradise for skiers and snowboarders, like this couple who've come to launch themselves down the slopes from a height of 2,300 metres. Where are you going? Wherever you want, Dasha. Let's go that way. Haven't we already been there? So what? I used to only ski in Europe before the Olympic Games, but my husband and I have come to Rosa Couture for the second year in a row. It's not as far away, the flight is shorter, it takes less time to get here, and it's cheaper as well. Up to 17,000 holiday makers per day, like Dasha and her husband, now come to ski at this resort. Yet 10 years ago, there was nothing here. Alexei, an alpine ski instructor, came to Rosa Couture the year before the Olympic Games. Before the Games, locals picked mushrooms and wild berries here. They put their herds out to graze here, their cows and their sheep. There were already plans to build a winter sports complex here when Russia won the Olympic Games in 2007. The Games sped the whole thing up. Vladimir Putin went to Austria in 2001 to watch the Winter Sports World Championships. When he saw the resort where it took place, the idea came to him to build an international standard winter sports resort in Russia. February 2001 at the Alpine Ski World Championships in Austria, and Vladimir Putin watched the show from the presidential box. Alongside him during this trip was his friend, Russian billionaire Vladimir Putanin. The oligarch had long dreamt of building a world-class resort in Russia. And in 2007, Russia won the right to hold the Olympics. Credit from a Russian state-owned bank flowed freely to those close to Vladimir Putin, who shared out the Olympic facilities to be built. The dream of Rosa Couture became reality. Your poles. Use your legs to slow down. All OK? You feeling comfortable? Follow me. Alexei comes from a small town north of the Polar Circle. Come on, keep going higher. His dream was to live and work in Sochi. The instructor over there, Sasha, is from Manutogorsk. And that's Lena over there. She's from Chelyabinsk. We're all from somewhere else. You earn a good salary here and live in good conditions. It's way above the standard of living in other parts of the country. 
This is Catcher's first ski lesson. Spread your heels apart, keep the heels apart, arms forward. She came to Sochi with her husband the year of the Olympics for Russia's first Formula One Grand Prix in a hundred years, which was held on a circuit built in the Olympic Park. When we arrived, we booked a hotel room for a week. We extended that by a week after the race and then for another week. And we stayed in Sochi. In winter, it's 20 degrees by the sea and there's sun. And an hour away by car, there are the mountains where we can ski. At the bottom of the slopes, 145 hotels have opened since the Olympics. And to recoup the huge investments made and attract a well-off clientele to Sochi, ready to spend their money, the Russian state had an idea. As night falls, another part of the mountains comes to life. Hello. Pick them up at Sector B from Gazprom Resort. Uh -huh. Got it. Okay, how many people? No problem, we'll take care of it. Okay, thank you. Dmitry Anfinoganov is the manager of the Sochi Casino. And right now, he can't get off the phone. It's now 5 p.m. and people who are coming down from the mountain want to reserve a table and have a good time at the casino. It's the high season and we have, shall we say, some very well-heeled clients. Sochi Casino opened exactly a year ago. And in Russia, that's significant. In Russia, this is a prohibited business. Today, there are only five zones across the country where gambling is legal. The decision to create a zone here was taken at the highest level of state. Thanks to this project, Sochi was provided with new air connections only last year. Spanning 33,000 square meters, the casino is housed in the former Olympic Games press center. A profitable decision by the authorities. On the second floor, is the packed-out poker club. Russian casinos were shut down in 2009, and now the clients around these tables have found their new El Dorado, here, in Sochi. I come here once a month. I certainly wouldn't come here so often if it wasn't for the casino. I'd come once a season if it was just to ski, and once a summer to go to the sea as well. But now I come 12 times a year. I came here in September from Khabarovsk in Russia's Far East, and I stayed. I've lived off of my poker winnings for five months now. I'm a former soldier, and if you know how much a soldier earns per month, well, I'm earning three times more here. The casino, however, aimed for international renown. And to get it, it hired a Russian poker star. In the 1990s, Artur Voskanyan founded Russia's first poker clubs. The five international tournaments we organized at Sochi Casino in 2017 were without a doubt the largest in the entire history of Russian poker. Proud of its success, Sochi Casino is putting on the Ritz tonight to celebrate its first anniversary. Despite its casino, its beaches and its ski slopes, Sochi is still waiting for its foreign visitors. Last year, 6,400,000 tourists immersed themselves in the subtropical climate. Of those, 99.6% were from Russia. That's despite a system called Open Skies, which for four years now has allowed foreign companies to land without restrictions in Sochi. The brand new airport cost $450 million and management hopes it'll be more profitable in the future than it is right now.
Our airport has the capacity to receive 10 million passengers a year. And in 2017, we received more than 5,700,000. Of course, that's a little disappointing, seeing as our technical capacities allow us to cater for far more flights and passengers than are arriving now. There's no doubt more information about Sochi and the infrastructure created for tourists and visitors here should target countries in Europe and the Middle East. One person who's made a point of promoting Sochi worldwide is Vladimir Putin. He met Syria's president Bashar al-Assad here last November and organizes international summits in the city as well. It makes sense to hold them in Sochi. The infrastructure set up next to the sea and spread over 200 hectares of the Olympic Village and the Olympic Park. We asked Sochi's deputy mayor, who's in charge of all this property, to take us on a guided tour. Over there is the Iceberg Skating Palace. When the Olympic Games were on, the short track speed skating and figure skating competitions were held there. Now large events are staged there, like the huge skating show that takes place four times a year. And there's the Fisht Stadium, a unique project built for the opening and closing Olympic ceremonies. It was rebuilt afterwards. This year, six games of the World Cup will be held there. Sergei Yurchenko is convinced. Six stadiums and all the infrastructure that comes with them isn't over the top for Sochi. All these facilities are used and that creates jobs for people. That allows us to extend our chain of restaurants. These are shops that are now open all year round and welcome a large number of customers. Our guide is keen to show us the pride of Sochi. This Formula One circuit is one of the world's best. The first race was held here in autumn 2014. Running these Olympic facilities costs around $40 million over six years, taken from the local and regional budgets. But the deputy mayor doesn't want to talk about money. The Olympic Games haven't just left a material legacy. Above all, it's left a sporting legacy. And for us, sport is about improving the health of our nation and our citizens. In Sochi, though, not everyone shares this optimistic vision. Evgeny Muzukov is in open conflict with the authorities. Last year, his restaurant on the Olympic Village's seaside promenade was bulldozed. Over there is the Olympic Park's new train station. A huge modern station. And it's useless. There are no passengers to speak of. A hundred days of your life is in full swing here. There's a lot of people, there's movement, events are taking place. Yes, 100 days a year. The other 265 days, it's empty. After Yevgeny lost his old restaurant, he opened a new one in one of the hotel complexes built for the Olympics. These are closed areas, accessed only by the hotel's few clients. And for Yevgeny, that's a real challenge to his livelihood. We effectively work only for the people who live in this hotel complex, and the problem is that customers don't come on a regular basis. It's also about the high season and the off season. In summer, we don't need extra customers because we are at capacity. But in the off season, we're half full or even completely empty. But Yevgeny's troubles started here. 35 kilometers from the Olympic Park. It was 2013 when this road was slated to be rebuilt for the Olympics. They were supposed to transform this part of the road into a straight line, like that. My house was right there. They tore down the house but didn't build the road. So that's where we are. Officially, the authorities compensated or rehoused the 1,000 families displaced due to Olympic construction. 
but Jevgeny says he never received any compensation. They took the money and put it straight into their own pockets. They claim to have compensated people and built a new road. But as you can see, the upshot is that someone has claimed this land for themselves. They put a fence around it. It's surely been sold and resold. The Sochi Olympics were mired in corruption scandals. But here, most people seem to have put that behind them. Because the Olympics gave the city a new lease of life. Elena Volochin and Thomas Lowe revisiting Sochi for France 24. That's all from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and all the previous editions as well on our website at france24.com. More news coming up in just a moment. Thanks for watching.